Stella must swear the testimony you give in this case should be true, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you back. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Pickett, you have a very uh, low voice, and so I'm just going to ask you, um, would you state your name for the record just so you can make sure we're hearing you okay? Uh, Sh Sean Richard Pickett. Okay, that was very good. Thank you. Uh, Maybe if you pull that microphone up a little bit, then you don't need to lean into it. It'll be a little more natural for you. Good. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pickett, you, you've lived in Avoca, Wisconsin? Yes. And uh, when did you move there? Uh, two, late 2018. And uh, who did you move there with? Um, my mom and her boyfriend, Ernie. And by her, boy, the, by her boyfriend, Ernie, you mean Ernest Wheeler? Yes. Okay. And um, why was it you guys were moving to Avoca? Um, my, my grandpa, her father passed away and we couldn't afford the house. Okay. And um, had Mr. Wheeler moved from Iowa right then or had he been living with you at grandpa's house? Uh, he was living with us at, our, at, at my grandpa's house for about to for about a month and a half. He, he came from downtown Mineral Point. Okay, so your grandfather's house was in Mineral Point? Yes. And um, did you guys get Chico the dog right away when you moved in in 2018? No, uh, we got him in uh, early 2017. Okay, so you, he'd already been living with you? Yes. So you guys get him as a puppy? Yes, four months old. Okay, so since Chico was four months old, he lived with you? Yes. And um, there was a time where you were just living alone in Avoca. When was that? I'd say uh, January to March of last year. Of 2021? Yes, about three, three and a half months. And um, when I say alone, though, the, the dog was still there with you? Yes. And you took care of the dog? Yes. You, you, you fed it? Yes. Where would you get the dog food? Uh, I'd, I'd order it from, uh, from Chewy. You so, ordered it from what? From Chewy online. Okay, so you ordered it online? Yeah. And, um, but you were living in the house? Yes. Okay. Um, because um, your neighbor said she had been a while. She, she thought the place had been abandoned. Um, but you were living there that whole time? Correct. Okay. And um, you would go buy food in Avoca, or how would you, how would you get food? Yeah, uh, I, I'd go and get the food uh, from the gas station. Okay, is that pretty much the only place to get food in Avoca? Yeah, they, they got two bars, but... But like groceries, the only place you can get it is, is at yeah. a gas station. Yes. And we're talking about a gas station, we're not talking about a quick trip or anything, it's just an old-timey gas station. Uh, it's, 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 it's a quick trip, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, was there a time where um, Ernie and your mom returned? Yes. Do you remember when that was? Uh, probably uh, at the end of March, uh, March 20, 24th or 25th. Of 2021? Yes, last year. And your, your mom stayed, but Ernie did not? Yes. And why was that? Uh, I confronted him with the... Well, with uh, papers proving that he was a sex offender. Okay, and so he, he took offense at that confrontation, or? Yes, my, and my mom told him to leave, and he left. 
Okay, and um, what was the plan going forward then? There was still a for sale sign in the yard. Uh, she, she, she changed the realtors because the last realtor wasn't, she wasn't doing a good job. And she, we found a new realtor and we're looking to sell the place and move out of Stateville, Illinois. Move to Stateville, Illinois. Move out of state to oh, Illinois. Oh, move out of state to Illinois, sorry. Yes. Um, is there a particular reason why Illinois? Uh, this is good on Wisconsin and uh, Illinois is cheap. Okay. And so, to be clear, on, on May 10th of 2020, when the house was not sold. No. It was just being uh, shown by a realtor. Yes. To the extent people would come. Had people come to see the house? No, because it was... Uh, it was, we, we just, she just got a new realtor and uh, the realtor was still looking for people or waiting for phone calls. Okay, so it wasn't like there was an imminent move. You guys weren't going to move in a, in a near time. Oh, uh, we, we, were, we, were uh, we were trying to get it done and sold within about four months. Okay. Four months from, from May. Yes. Okay. And um, getting closer to May 10th, though, were there, was there a time where you decided it was better to, to be out in the woods? Yes. And why was that? Uh, we weren't getting along. Uh, there's, there's been conflict for years. Uh, she didn't like me being around. Uh, we just weren't getting along. Okay, and so uh, when I say in the woods, how, how far away from your house am I talking about? Uh, it's on the outskirts. It's on the outskirts of town, so about thirty about thirty minutes from walking distance. Okay, it's on the outskirts of Avoca. Yeah, we were on we were on one side of town, and then it was on the completely other side. So by a cemetery. Yes. And uh, this was in, in April. Uh, late April, around towards towards the end of April was the first time. Okay. And uh, did you stay out there the whole time? Uh, for the most part, I two days. It was very cold. I couldn't feel my feet, you know. So I went back to the house. I kind of talked things over with her. And things were kind of at a standstill a little bit. So I, I went back and I stayed there for... About another week, week and a half, before, okay. before I went back out in the woods again. Okay, so you went back out in the woods again, and that was the beginning of May? Uh, yes. And, um... What do you think of the defendant's testimony so far? Tweet us at Court TV. Let us know. I tell you what, I can't get over that voice. That voice is what's striking me from the outset here. You're not going to miss a moment of what Sean Pickett is telling this jury. We're hitting pause. We'll get you right back in the courtroom after this quick message. Right now. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant covering for Ashley Wilcott this afternoon. We are watching the possessed by evil murder trial playing out in the state of Wisconsin. We're in day number two. The trial moving along quite rapidly as the state has rested just a short time ago. And now the defendant is choosing to take the stand. Sean Pickett just took the stand a few minutes before our commercial break. We want to go back and now I've got two words for you. That voice. And what would you do with yourself? Would you walk around town or? Yeah, yes, I'd, stay, I'd hang out in the woods for a while and then uh, I'd walk around town every once in a while. I'd, I'd go and walk around town. Did you have like a cook stove out there? I mean, how would you eat? Uh, I, brought, I brought perishable food from the house. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, Getting closer to uh, Monday, May 10th, um, let's take us back to that midnight, the midnight uh, where May 9th is becoming May 10th. Um, Ms. Nondorf said she saw you uh, in your garage. Were you out in your garage at about midnight? Um, yes, I was grabbing supplies. Okay, to take back to the woods. Yes. And so, is that what you did? Yes. 
And um, and then on Monday, May 10th, you, you woke up at what time? Or very early in the morning. And, and what did you do? Uh, well, I, I, I went in town that day. I, I sat at the church, I believe, or... Yeah. Okay, nothing, nothing special to start out the, the morning. No. At some point, though, you returned home. Yes. And um, Mr. Gilbertson testified that he saw you that day around noon. Is that is that accurate? Yes. And so you you went home. Did you get home? Were you there hours before or minutes before Mr. Gilbertson showed up? Uh, yeah, not 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 too long. Uh, probably within. Maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, and he uh, he said um, the dog wasn't barking and you wouldn't come out. Was there anything unusual about that? Well, I'm um, I'm not I'm I'm not really great friends with him, and uh, I was busy trying to make some food. So you were busy. What I couldn't hear. Trying I was, to make some food. Trying to make some food. Okay. Yeah. So um, he came and wanted you to come outside, and you, you just didn't want to. Well, he, he didn't ask me to come outside. He asked to come inside. Oh, he asked to come in. Yes. Okay. And, um, and he said what? Uh, I said no. Uh, I said no. I'm, I'm, I'm No. And uh, I told him that there was uh, some weird stuff going on. Uh, you know, it, my mom was acting funny with all the conflict, the tension, and it just it seemed very odd for him showing up like that because we're not friends. It was very unusual. Okay, you just didn't feel comfortable letting no, him in. No. Okay, so uh, so he departs, right? Yes. After a few minutes, and then you just continue making food. Yes. Um, and and where's your mom while this is going on? Oh, she was in the bedroom. Had you had you seen her at all that day? Uh. Yes. No, 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 because she was, she was sleeping at that time. Okay. Was it typical of her to be sleeping at noon? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes she'll wake up at 4 in the morning, she'll start drinking, she'll pass out drunk, wake up a few hours later, maybe start drinking again. So she, she could have been passed out drunk or just went to sleep not too long ago. Okay. You didn't know. You just knew she wasn't out and about and and the, she she stayed in the room that was farthest i guess west yes the room that they were found in the room that it happened in yes okay and so at this time the door was closed yes okay so you you were making food and then you you stayed there to eat it or what, what did you do uh i let you go outside you know make sure you had food make sure you had water i let him outside made some food I ate and then I left. Okay, and you you left to go where? I'm back to the woods. But you didn't stay back out in the woods. Uh, for a, I went back out there and I hanged out there for a few more hours. Yes. Okay, and then, uh, but then you, you, you went home again? Yes, I came back to the trailer to check on Chico. That's, that's the only reason why I came back was to check on Chico because I could not bring him with me in the woods because it was hard to take care of him or watch him while he was out there. Okay, and so um, you came back to, to look in on the dog. You came back home, and, and what did you do when you came back home? Uh, you talking later on in the day, or? Yes. Uh, I, I came back, I went inside, I was hungry again, and I made some mac and cheese. Okay, and, and so you ate the mac and cheese, or what did you do? Uh, I, ma I made one, I took a couple bites of it, put the other one in the microwave, and then I, I walked down, I went to go check on Chico. Okay, and when you went to check on Chico, did you see him? Uh, I, I walked down the hallway, saw that my room was kind of like almost like it's been like uh, ransacked almost. The futon was all 
out of place and it was all kind of scrambled in there and stuff. And I, I heard a commotion in the room next door where they were at. So I set the mac and cheese down. All right, we're going to hit the pause button. You're not going to miss any of this because we're getting toward that all-important part, the altercation, the lead-up to it, the mac and cheese, going to check on Chico the dog. Franz Borghardt, what do you think so far of this defendant? I don't buy it. I don't buy it. He, he just doesn't come across as credible. Um, he seems detached. He seems like he is trying to figure out the story, um, which sounds a lot different than whatever the truth is. So, and, and if I feel that way, there's a good chance some of the jurors feel that way. So the defense is going to have a big uphill battle if he continues to go down this road. Yeah, isn't that the truth? And uh, how are you liking defense counsel's questions to him? Any criticism there? So the problem is when you establish that there was a turbulent relationship with mom, that they didn't get along, that's great for establishing the foundation for a self-defense argument, but it also gives the defendant motive to kill mom. Um, it establishes that no, they didn't get along and that maybe, just maybe, he just decided to kill her and the dog, Chico. Uh, yeah, he's doing the best I think he can do with, with his client and look, the, the, the viewers need to remember, the defense attorney doesn't always make the decision on whether or not the defendant testifies. The defendant gets to make the final decision. So we never know whose call it is, but we know the defendant makes the final call. And sometimes as a defense attorney, you gotta deal with that. And that may be what we're looking at now. That's a great point. Yes, the decision always lies with the defendant. Counsel can counsel their client all day long. And uh, we, we all know that uh, clients don't always listen to the advice of esteemed counsel. So, so uh, that could be the case here or could not. Who knows? Uh, we're not privy to that. I appreciate all the insight you're offering. Franz Borghardt, you're going to stick around and stay on the show as we head into our next hour. I'm going to hand things off to my esteemed colleague, Michael Ayala. He's in the studio. Good to see you, my friend. We rarely get to share a screen together. That's and right, and it's a, I'm so proud to do so, Aww, Julie. And, and not only that, we're going to continue with our live coverage of Sean Pickett on the stand. And I agree with Franz. He's not doing that great, and this might be a situation where he told his attorney he wanted to testify, because I'm not mm -hmm. sure I'd put this guy on the stand. But oh we'll gosh, continue no. with his testimony. If anybody missed anything that happened earlier today, we'll get them caught up on all that as well. Also, the three things that we learned today from this trial that are going to be very important going forward. So keep it right here on Court TV. Do did you notice anything uh, about the house as you pulled up? Uh, it was just dark. I grabbed Sue and smacked her. His clothes appeared uh, to have droplets of what appeared to me to be dried blood. Mr. Pickett told us that he had been held hostage in the house and that they were going to try to in this murder or, or put this murder on, on him. Testimony in the Possessed by Evil murder trial continues today with several witnesses taking the stand, including the defendant himself. Sean Pickett once claimed evil voices told him to kill his mom and his dog, but now He's claiming self-defense. We'll get you back inside that courtroom in Wisconsin for more testimony in just a minute. Plus, a verdict in the trial of Eric Holder. The jury found the defendant guilty in the shooting death of Nipsey Hussle. In the Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, Department 104, the people of the state of California versus Eric Ronald Holder Jr. Case number BA 475908. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Eric Ronald Holder Jr., guilty of the crime of first degree murder of Ermius Ashkadon in violation of Penal Code Section 187, subsection A of felony, as charged in count one of the indictment. 
And we're still following the story of the woman who was on the run 43 days after being accused of killing pro cyclist Anna Mariah Wilson. She really blended in at this hostel, uh, but Zachary did tell us that the owner's mother actually had actually had suspicions about her. Uh, when she was taken into custody by local authorities, she was freaked out. Uh, it was described to us, but she didn't seem to put up any resistance. It didn't seem from what we were told. Well, Michael Ayala in for Judge Ashley Wilcott this hour, and this is Court TV Live. Now, we begin this hour of coverage in Wisconsin for the trial of Sean Pickett. The 21-year-old is accused of killing his dog and his mother at their home in Avoca, Wisconsin. Now, Pickett initially pled not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, claiming that evil voices told him to kill his mother. But now, the defense is taking an approach of self-defense. Mr. Pickett acted in self-defense upon discovering um, his mother um, stabbing the dog that when he confronted her with it, she turned upon him and was the object of her aggression. And very, you'll see it's a very small space. And you'll see, hear evidence that, that he had acted in self-defense upon this uh, confrontation. Things are moving fast in the trial. Today we heard testimony from the victim's boyfriend where he testified to witnessing prior abuse between Pickett and his mother Susan. You and Sean didn't get along terribly well, did you? No. Uh, did he at times also not get along well with his mother? Yes. Do you recall any instance in which Sean got physical with his mother? Yes. In particular, uh, do you recall an incident around Christmas of 2020 when Sean struck Susan at the dinner table? Yes. Overall, it's directed to a uh, point, a topic. And what do you remember about that incident, Mr. Wheeler? Um, Sean got mad because he, he said that the TV was up too loud. And he grabbed Sue and smacked her and threw her out of the chair. All right, we want to get you back inside the courtroom now for more testimony from the defendant himself, Sean Pickett. Let's get back in. I went to the next room. Okay. And when you're in the next room, the door was closed. Yes. But, but you... So you heard something behind the door? Yes, it sounded like a commotion, yes. And so then you opened the door? Yes. And when you opened the door, what did you see? Oh, uh, my mom was stabbing Chico. And was he on his back, or was he on... Uh, could you tell? Uh, kind of. I mean, it happened... It, he was on his back or his side, yes. Okay, so you, you see her stabbing Chico, and what did you do? Uh, I pretty much uh, kind of like yelled like, hey, or like, like, what are you doing? Pretty much, or uh, almost like uh, so something like that. Um, oh. ind indistinctively, it's just natural instinct. Okay. And uh, when you yelled, hey, what are you doing, then what happened? Uh, she, 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 she looked surprised, and she, she turned around, and she came at me with a knife. Okay, and were you all the way in the room at this time? Yes. And was the door closed behind you? Y yes. I, I kind of, I kind of, I didn't like walk in. I opened the door and then I kind of uh, like fast walked into the room. So almost kind of like ran in, but I didn't. Okay. And then you ran in and she came at you with a knife and then what happened? Uh, we, we wrestled over control of the knife. We wrestled over control of the knife, and which is surprising because she was a small woman, but I was very malnourished at the same time. She was very strong. Uh, she, we wrestled in front of control of the knife, and instinctively and naturally, I, I got a hold of it once or twice, and we were still wrestling, and I just naturally stabbed her. Two times, I believe. Okay. To, to, to get her to stop attacking me, because she would not stop attacking me. And when you stabbed her twice, did she then stop attacking? No, she didn't even respond to it. She didn't respond. 
Did you, but you had gotten the knife away from her? E somewhat, yes. Okay. So, um... She was, she, was still, she was still trying to grab it when I got some more control of it. She was still trying to grab the knife? Yes, from me. And that was when you stabbed her? Yes. And, um, and then subsequent to that, did you just leave the room then, or what happened? No, uh, we, we continued fighting, almost kind of like wrestling, and uh, she, we, we, we kind of tripped because the room was very small. She reached, she, she kind of like tripped over the bed a little bit, and the knife fell, and she fell for a second, and I seen that was my opportunity to go and get help, and I went towards the door. When you say you tripped over the bed, this wasn't a bed that was on a frame, was it? It was just a mattress laying on the it, floor? It was just a big mattress, yes. And it wasn't like a mattress on top of a bo box spring. It was just the mattress laying on the floor. Yes. Okay. So you, you tripped over that, and you both tripped over it? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I kind of caught myself more than she did, so... Okay, and so you, you said that you took that as your opportunity to leave? Yes. Why were you going to leave? Uh, call for get help, uh, call the cops to get help. Okay, but uh, did you leave then? Uh, I, I, was, I, I got to the door, and as I got to the door, she was up and coming at me with the knife again. So she had recovered the knife? Yes. Had it fallen to the floor? It had, it had fallen to the floor when, when we tripped, yes. Okay, so you saw her um, coming at you with the knife again. Yes. And then what did you do? Well, the door the door's right there, and you got this, uh, you get the dresser was right there where the machete was on. Uh, her, her boyfriend likes swords and all that stuff, so, so the metal bar was his, so it was already in the room. It was right there on the dresser. Beside the dresser, I just, just naturally, uh, she was coming at me with a knife, and it, it was just natural, almost like na it was just natural instinct. I just instinctively grabbed the metal bar, kind of told her to stop, well, stop, uh, stop, and then I, I swung, she didn't stop, and I swung the metal bar. And when you swung the metal bar, what happened? Uh, I, I believe I connected, uh, I believe it I hit her in somewhere in, in the head or somewhere. Okay, and, and then did she keep coming at you or what uh, happened? Oh, she, 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 she fell. She didn't get knocked. At, she didn't, she didn't lay, she didn't fall on the floor, but she, she kind of, she kind of went down a little bit. Yes. She kind of what? She, she kind of fell down pretty much. And then as, as she fell down, she was still trying to come at me and get up with the knife. So I, in, I instinctively hit her two or three more times. And then uh, she wasn't moving anymore? No. And so uh, did you then leave the room? Uh, no, I went and checked on Chico, see if he was okay, see if he was breathing. It wasn't, it wasn't a long time, it was just very quickly, I went and checked on him. Uh, he, he wasn't moving, so I just, I gave him a hug, and I, I got up, I left the room, and I, I called the cops. Okay, you called the cops, uh, like a cell phone you had? Yes. And um, that was at, at 3.37 p.m., is that right? I'm not sure. Okay, that's that's when the... the, the, the it sounds right, though, right? It was sometime in the afternoon, yes. Okay. Um, then, uh, subsequent to that, um, Officer Carey came. Do you recall what happened when, when he came? Uh, I, I went outside. I was, I was crying. I was very emotional. I went outside, and I was still on the phone. And... He, I think he might have pointed his, I think he might have had his gun out. Uh, he turned around, he told me to put my hands up and he put me in, uh, put me in handcuffs. So, so 
also, uh, Chief Carey put you in handcuffs. Yes, protective custody, I guess you'd say. And then, uh, did he put you in the squad car? Yes. Uh, still handcuffed? Still handcuffed. Uh, he had his, uh, still handcuffed and he turned the uh, camera on in his, in his uh, vehicle. Okay. And um, then he didn't stay with you. You were just left alone in the squad car? Yes, for about an hour, hour and a half. Okay, you were alone in the squad car for an hour, an hour and a half. Yes. Handcuffed. And um, who got you out of the squad car then? Uh, I believe it was him and one of his partners. They, were, they came to check on me, I think, and... That's when they gave me water, I believe. Okay, they, so they, at some point they take you to the Avoca Town Hall. Yes. Do you remember that? Do you remember how long it was? Was it right after they gave you the water? Uh, I think it might have been. No, I was in shock. I was very, it was a very traumatic experience. I was, I was in shock. Uh, uh, it it could have been maybe... Uh, well, I, I seen on the papers that I arrived at the station at six, six thirty, six o'clock. So maybe not too long after okay. the water. So okay, you were you were in the, the vicinity of the squad car for at least a couple hours. Yes. And when you got to uh, Evoca Town Hall, did they take the handcuffs of you then? I believe so. Ian, do you remember them taking your clothes? So he told this story. Do you believe him? Do you think this jury is believing him? All right. We're going to hit the pause button. We'll be back in just a moment. We're going to take a quick break. But when we return, we're going to continue with Sean Pickett's testimony in the Possessed by Evil murder trial. Keep it right here on Court TV. 0793. a complicated story. Chief Schramm pushed the door open. Uh, we observed a body on the floor. That he intentionally killed both his mother and his dog. Stabbing Susan in the throat and striking her six to eight times with the metal bar and hitting Chico with that same bar before stabbing him multiple times in the chest and throat. Sean will testify and put in evidence that Susan Pickett is dead. However, Sean acted in self-defense. All right, testimony in the trial of Sean Pickett continues. The 21-year-old is accused of killing his mother, Susan, and their brown and white pit bull, Chico. Now, Pickett claimed he was going in and out of consciousness and possessed by evil voices when the killing occurred. That was originally. But defense attorney Jeffrey Everickson says Pickett gave a false confession and acted in self-defense after the defendant's mother killed their dog and then came after him. The case has been moving very quickly. The state rested earlier today after about a day and a half of testimony. The defense started their case. First person they called to the stand was the defendant himself. So let's get, back, let's get you back into the courtroom for more of Sean Pickett's testimony. Do you remember all the things you said to them? No, I do not. Um, there was uh, testimony about you telling them that um, they had been playing mind games with you. Um, do you remember saying that? Uh, I w it was a very shocking, traumatic experience. I was in shock. I was traumatized. Uh, almost, uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't remember it, no. Well, um, was that something that you felt that they'd been playing mind games with uh, you. yes yes and what do you what did you mean by that and what do you mean by that now uh, mind games uh, lying manipulation uh, psychological stuff like reverse psychology uh, you, there's there's many different forms of what you would call mind games pretty much lying and manipulating what would they be lying uh, to you about? Uh, you, you just like uh, like uh, Ernie, he, he doesn't like me. He, he like you said, he's never respected me. But he, he, I, he had problems with me. Uh, 
before before they went to Iowa, he 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 ran into the room and started screaming at me, saying I was obsessed with my computer and all this other stuff. So I, I knew they had problems, and that and that problem, and he felt like that for years, and that that created tension and conflict between us. And he was pretty much trying to turn my mom against me, and I was trying to warn and protect my mom, and she did not want to believe me because Ernie was manipulating her. Telling, pretty much making her believe that I was the one on boat, that I was the one creating problems, and it wasn't him. Okay. Uh, so you don't remember telling them about the mind games, but you felt they were playing mind games with you? They were, yes. Okay. And um, in terms of other things you said to those police officers where you said that, that Ernie had kidnapped you and held you hostage. Um, do you remember saying any of that? Uh, I, I do not. I, 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 know when I, when I, I know when I called the cops, I told them I was in the woods, like I was. I was in the woods and I came back. Uh, I, I know the first thing I told the investigators was that I was in the woods. Uh, I, was, I was very detached, almost from reality, almost. Being in such a, such a shocking, traumatic experience, uh, when, when, when they asked me what day or time of the week it was, I didn't even know what day or time of the week it was. I didn't even know when my mom and Chico were murdered. So, no, I, I do not remember saying that. Okay. And uh, do you remember telling them that y you hadn't slept in a long time? Yes, I was sleep deprived, yes. And so, uh, when you told them you hadn't slept in a long time, that was accurate? Yes. And do you know how long it had been since you'd slept in a uh, long not, not a lot. I didn't sleep much in a few days. You know, it's very cold outside. I was stressed out. I was, I was worried, you know. Uh, maybe a couple hours within a few days. Maybe like two days. Maybe just a, just a few hours, you know. When you uh, said you were um, wrestling with your mom for the knife, uh, you said she was strong. You said you were malnourished. What, what did you mean by that? Um, very malnourished. Uh, I didn't eat a lot. Uh, I pretty much scrounged for food, you know. Uh, as you've seen in the pictures, I was surprised myself. I looked very skinny, almost, almost just as skinny as her. Uh, I was only 120 pounds at the time. When you say you had a scrounge for food, what do you mean? Uh, well, when, when they were in Iowa, I uh, made my own bread to survive pretty much with flour and water, so I even dumpster dived at one time. Even what? I even dumpster dived at one time. Oh, dumpster dive, okay. They were in Avoca? Yes. And um, you just referenced when they went to Iowa. Um, was that a surprise to you? Had you been prepared for them to go to Iowa? Uh, no, no. They were they were talking about it for months, months before it happened. Uh, when I when I went to jail over a fight that Ernie caused at 19, when I was 19 years old, he caused the fight. Uh, when I was in jail, then you know Ernie manipulated and played mind games with my mom, making her believe that since he's from Iowa, that they could move down there and find jobs and live comfortably. And uh, when, they, when they went down there when I was 19, uh, they got robbed, their, their place got robbed and they had to move back to Iowa and they ended up in a bigger hole than what they were. So. So you weren't, you weren't prepared for that? You hadn't laid in cans of... No, I, I was not prepared. I woke up the one day, I woke up the next morning, and they were gone. And they didn't leave you a detailed note or said, hey, there's a steak in the freezer or anything like that? No. So how did you get food then? Uh, well, well, before they left, that, that, before that night, me and Ernie, Ernie, uh, me and Ernie got into a big argument. Yeah? Yeah. And then the next morning I woke up and they were gone. So. Right, but that, so like three days from then, how did you get food? Uh, I had, I had, uh, they, they left some stuff like uh, spaghetti noodles, 
and some cereal and stuff. And it was enough to last about a month. Okay. And to be clear, they, they left Chico with you. All right. So the defendant there on the stand claiming that he was left alone by his mom and her boyfriend and he had to scrounge for food, even diving in dumpsters, <clears throat> excuse me, to find food at certain points. I do want to make a quick point, though. If you notice, there is a red light uh, shining against the wall that's also partly on the face of the defendant. We're not doing that. That's actually an exit sign inside the courtroom. It has nothing to do with our cameras, nothing to do with what we're doing. Um, it's kind of unfortunate, actually, but at the end of the day, it's not something we're doing, uh, so hopefully you don't think that uh, we're trying to editorialize in any way with that light. Again, it's an exit sign that's reflecting onto the wall and onto his face. All right, let me bring back in my guests for this hour, uh, criminal defense attorneys Franz Borghardt and Matthew Mann. And Gino are with me. Both guys, uh, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, of course, the question of the day, and I'll, I'll start with you, Matthew, because I kind of heard uh, what Franz thinks, but I want to get your take on, on how Sean Pickett is doing on the stand thus far. Well, it's always a risk to put your uh, client on the stand, and uh, it's a strategic decision that every defense attorney or defense team has to make. Um, you know, he has a, a, a flat affect um he's not really impressive as a witness let alone the fact that he's given multiple versions uh, of what occurred on that day initially uh he was a hostage of uh his stepfather and then he heard voices and he was told to kill and now he he, he tells the jury that uh, his mother was stabbing uh, Chico and and basically he was defending Chico and then his mother attacked him uh, and it's self defense so um, it, this is going to be a real struggle for the defense to to convince this jury that the defendant is a credible believable witness yeah Franz you know he, he makes perfect points I mean a couple of notes that I have essentially is that. He, he basically is wrestling with mom, talking about mom, who's about 85 pounds, is really strong. And that, that can happen, but she keeps coming after him after he stabs her. But then he doesn't explain how the dog got hit with a metal bar. There was also an injury on the dog regarding a metal bar. Doesn't talk about that, but he hits his mom with the metal bar. A lot of it's just not adding up for me, Franz. So in the physical evidence, and we've heard testimony about the physical evidence with the weapons that were collected. When those, when that testimony, when that evidence doesn't align, when his version of the story doesn't align with the physical evidence, that is a recipe for a conviction. Um, that is what he needs to explain on the stand. He needs to explain why is it that the dog had the had the had the uh, trauma wound? Why is it that his mother was a challenge to being overpowered? Powered? Why did he have to kill her? These are all things he has to answer, and the jury has to believe it. But quickly, let me ask you this, this, Matthew. I thought also once in opening statements when they talked about the fact that the mother was attacking the dog, stabbing the dog that they would have to come up with an explanation for that too. Um, why was she attacking the dog? Did she just have a psychotic break? And they never really explained that. He didn't have any sense of why that happened. I thought that might be a problem as well. Your thoughts? Well, I think it certainly is. I mean, th that's a, a question that the jury's gonna ask. Why was she attacking the dog? Uh, you know, this was the family dog, uh, obviously, uh, Sean had some affection for the dog, as he he says. So I'm I'm sure that the family, uh, family did. But yeah, that leaves a gaping hole. There has to be some explanation. The jury wants to make sense of this, and, and unfortunately, uh, for the defendant, I don't think Sean Pickett is is helping them sort those questions out. There there are gaping holes that they've that are being left by his testimony. And the jury's going to fill those on their own, and it's usually not good news for the defendant. No, it's not, unfortunately. All right, he's going to continue with his testimony on the stand. Again, we hit the pause button, folks, so we'll take you back in when we get back. After this break, of course, more testimony from the defendant, Sean Pickett. Save 15%.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala in for Judge Ashley Wilcott this hour. I want to take you back now quickly into the courtroom. On the stand is Sean Pickett. Again, this is a Wisconsin versus Sean Pickett. He's charged with the first degree murder of his mom. He claims he acted in self-defense, that he heard a commotion in a room next door. When he went in, mom was attacking the dog and then she tried to attack him, ultimately leading to him killing her. That's the story that he's told this jury. He's now trying to explain to the jury why he gave many different accounts of what happened to the police. So let's get back into the court. And like you said, you ordered food from online to, to feed him. Uh, prior to them leaving, yes, maybe like a month before that or, or something like that. Yes. So a month prior to that, you ordered like a great big bag of dogs. Yes, it usually lasts about three months or so. Were you typically uh, the person who took care of Chico? Uh, for the most part, yes. Uh, when I didn't have money or something, Ernie would help and buy food since he was the only one that was getting a disability in there, so. He, he, had, he had a dog named Bella as well, so. Ernie had a dog named Bella. Did they take Bella with them? Yes, they did. Okay. And uh, Ms. Nondorf said um, she saw you after a couple of months. Um, had you, for those couple of months, been in the house, or had you been out in the woods? Oh, uh, I, was, I was in the house. Okay. And you just had, like, like blankets in the windows or something that she wouldn't see the lights? Uh, well, maybe she didn't pay attention that much. Uh... Well, she testified that in near to May 10th, Suddenly there was a blanket on your window. Um, how do you account for that? I'm not too sure. It didn't have any sort of special significance? No. There, there was no blinds on the window, so... Okay. Um, in a lot of the rooms, there was a blanket on the window. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. Yes, in the other room, there was a blanket on the window. There was a sheet in the bedroom where my mom stayed. There was a, there was a sheet over that window. Okay. And um, just to be clear, um, you, do you recall much of anything that you, you said to the officers um, on that day, that evening of May 10th? I was blacking in and out of consciousness. I told him that at one time. I, was, I told him I was blacking out in and out of consciousness. I told them at one point, I, don't, I told them at the, end of the inter, at the end of the interrogation that I was hearing voices and they were telling me to say random things like being held hostage and supposedly uh, being dead. Okay, so you remember saying that. So, yes, to a certain extent, yes. Okay. And um, you were saying that because that was descriptive of your mental state at the time? Well, pretty much. I was, I was coming out of consciousness, and I come out for a few seconds, and I knew I was blacking out. So I was trying to, like, almost, like, warn them or, or tell them to a certain extent. Had you ever had that happen before? Uh, no, not, 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 no, 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 not been a very long time. Okay. Um, and um, just switching gears here, prior to that, um, it was not the expectation that, that Ernie was coming back and you guys were going to be, uh, you know, she was going to be leaving you to go back to Ernie. No, that, 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 that's a lie. Yeah, that, that's a lie. He, he didn't, he called one time to want to come and get his uh, belongings because uh, his, his son's ashes were there in the, in the living room. That, that was just another lie trying to make me look like the bad guy. So, um, so you still had stuff there yes. at, your, at your place in Avoca? Yes. For example, uh, what besides his son's ashes, do you remember what other kind of stuff he had uh, his, there? His son's ashes, his safe, 
Uh, the file cabinet that I found the sex offenders, sex offender papers in. Uh, he had swords. He had uh, dressers and cabinets, uh, miscellaneous things. And he said, like the the machete and the the metal rod, that that stuff was his too. Yes, he he liked stuff like that. Yes. And, uh, and if I ask you this already, I apologize. I don't think I have. Um, do you remember telling the, the officers that, that Ernie was the one who did everything? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, those are all the questions I have for you right now. Ross? I don't know, I'd be able to take a brief recess. There's a fair amount of new information that came in.